Hello friends, welcome back to The Workroom. If you haven't been here before, my name's Ash, and this channel is about the fun of costuming and live action roleplay. Given that I've just come back from a LARP, I thought it'd be fun to take you on a bit of a tour of my costume for this event, the kind of decisions that went into making it, how I've adapted the costume across multiple events of playing the same character, and some ideas about where I'm going to go after this. I should also point out that for those of you who like sewing videos, some of these items I did make myself and I'm going to take you through that process in some later videos. Videos. I was just very up against it time-wise before the event and didn't film a whole lot of this process. We'll get on to that. So first things first, some context. For most live-action roleplay games, you will need a costume. You almost always provide this yourself, and how you decide what to wear is a very unique and personal process, but it almost always starts with the costume brief. Or if you're here in the UK, the kit brief, because we call this kit. I'm aware that garb is also a word that's in use in other costumed activities, but in the UK LARP scene, we don't really use that word, it's kit. LARP kit briefs are hugely variable and often not very well written. That's a topic for a later video. But also on top of your kit brief, you might look at other information about the game setting or the game themes and come up with ideas based on that. So this game, the kit brief was pretty good, fairly relaxed. I think I've described it to other people as, I don't know, wear a waistcoat. It's a fantasy world that is mid an industrial revolution. It's not exactly the same as our industrial revolution. Things are happening at different rates and in different places. It is also immediately post civil war. There was a revolution, the monarchy was overthrown after a period of great civil unrest. Also there are monsters and uh, questionable magic. So our out of this set of information and a few other elements like what my skill picks were, it's a very combat heavy system, what kind of combat I was going to be involved in. Based on all of that I picked out a couple of key ideas to take forward with designing the costume for my character G. G is not his full name, he is in fact Reginald Timothy Aurelius Fanshawe Smythe the third. And for a variety of reasons, some of them external pressures, because the monarchy's been overthrown, being a member of the nobility is not great and likely to get you kicked when you're down, but also he in of himself is quite uncomfortable with his family and his heritage. So that's some of the key ideas I was starting with. I know that this is a game inspired by the early industrial revolution, but also not quite. It's sort of early Victorian, but some some things are also quite Regency, but also some things are quite late 18th century. So for example, we're still really using muzzle loading muskets and pistols, but the country has a established and fairly extensive railway network. Also typewriters exist, as do photographs. So it's actually the technology is over a wide period, things are happening at different rates. That to me said that I could draw on a bunch of periods from sort of 70 1890 through to like 1860 as inspiration for this costume. Now let's also talk about the fact that there's this revolution and civil war that's just happened. I originally played the first weekend long event of this system, really really enjoyed myself, loved the system, loved the game, loved the player base, realised I had made the wrong character for this game. Seeing how the game played on the ground I have misjudged this. I've built a close combat character when in reality this is a, it's a system system that has guns, mid-range combat is way more common than close up, and also I just enjoyed that more. I generated a character that I thought was going to be, she was a revolutionary but she was an extremist and she'd done some stuff during the revolution and I thought like other people would engage with that and challenge it and then I hit play and realised that every single player character in this setting is extremely dodgy, with a couple of notable exceptions. The kind of playstyle and the kind of interaction I had in mind were not what was going to happen with that character, and I could have retired her or just restatted her between sessions, but I decided instead to... Look, someone said unless anyone wants to volunteer to be ritually sacrificed in order that we can fight the big bad, we're gonna have to find another way. And I already 
already knew I didn't want to keep playing this character, so you know, it just seemed like the logical thing to do. And I feel like that experience really sets the tone for what this game is like. I unfortunately missed the next event, I, it clashed with something, I couldn't make it. And then I played the third weekend long event as my new character, G, having also roped in some of my friends to play as childhood best friends who'd now grown up and ended up on opposite sides of the war. And that event was, unfortunately, October of 2019. So the subsequent event didn't happen for three years. Did I work on my kit in that time? No. Let me explain why. When I originally created G, I had just come off the back of a four-year campaign LARP in which I had made new costumes for every event. And for the final event, I made four completely new costumes. It was actually five, but I had all the pieces for outfit number five already because I made my gambeson reversible, plus armor, plus the floor-length fur-lined cloak that I had hand-painted the exterior of, plus, hang on, this is something I commissioned for that character. I do not have the skill set to make this. The very wonderful Silverleaf Girl made this for me. This is brass. This is Sculpey, which is in itself not light, but I cannot overemphasize enough that this is actually metal. It's also hollow inside because this part is a scroll case. And somehow I got all of this onto a train to travel to the event. I didn't want to do this anymore. So for G, I designed a costume that I wasn't going to have to change. Let me put this away and I'll explain that. G was a member of a noble family. He was the son of a duke, which is the highest status of nobility in this country after the royal family. He was not the preferred one in line for the dukedom. He also made some choices. So he'd been shipped off to university to keep him out of the way. When the revolution broke out, his father sent him an army commission, told him to come back a hero or die trying. The royalists lost the civil war. G deserted, spent six months sleeping in ditches on the run from the revolutionary authorities, trying to get home and basically finish the one last thing that he'd promised to do. He then massively overcharged a magical ritual trying to do the thing he'd promised he was going to do. It blew up in his face and he woke up in handcuffs in the hands of the organisation that the players of this game represent, who are the secret government agency there to deal with magic and the supernatural. So I wanted a military uniform that had been extremely heavily distressed, and with no means nor resources to access new clothes, I was just going to wear this for the whole campaign and not make any big changes to it. I had not, of course, anticipated that I would have three years of downtime in the middle with no LARP, but there you go. For my first event, what I started with was a shirt from Primark. I actually think I got it from a charity shop, but it was originally, yep, that's pre-marché. So it was a very, very cheap shirt that looked kind of rough and LARP-like, and a pair of the Primark trousers that I live in, apparently, despite the fact that they don't actually fit me that well. The first thing I did with these is that I stuck them into a pot with either strong tea or weak coffee. I then also applied fake blood to them. I put them in a bathtub and poured literal mud all over them and rubbed it in, and I also attacked them with a cheese grater. I did all this fairly organically. The trousers aren't too bad. There's one or two big holes in there, but in general they're all right. The shirt really got drenched. I also stuck some fake blood on there. It's accumulated more fake blood over the event, but I also specifically wanted one specific tear in it because there's one specific injury. I agreed with another player that because G had been doing some crime in order to survive, not very well it has to be said, a friend of mine was playing an agent of the law, let us say, in this setting. She would have tried to apprehend G, G got away, but did get injured in the process. And I actually came in for the first event with a prosthetic silicon gunshot wound glued to the back of my shoulder. And there's a tear in the shirt that matches that. And there's also a bullet hole in the jacket that I created. Brings me onto the jacket. When I decided that I wanted to play someone who'd been in the military, there wasn't a lot of information in the guidebook about that. So I contacted the refs and said, can I 
country wield this or do you have a specific idea of what the military uniforms for this country look like? And the response was basically, we figure there's a lot of military uniforms because there's a lot of like strong regional identities going on in this country. Also because we just use whatever we've got. If we had to imagine what the ideal military uniform for this specific region that you're from would look like, we're thinking of Sharps rifles. Then I had to go have a bit of a sit down because, oh boy, Sharps rifles was formative. And then I set about making myself a Regency-esque military jacket. So they did say dark green. They also said the color of the royal family is purple. So if you can incorporate some purple, please do. I also decided that the rifles notoriously don't have brass buttons, allegedly because they thought if they gave them brass buttons, they'd sell them. But I decided that I wasn't going to put any buttons, rank insignia, metallics onto this jacket because if G had those, he would have sold them to buy food. And so I made this jacket from a piece of poly wool I had in my stash. I used some scraps to do the black cuffs. I used a deep purple satin for the lining. I have a panelled jacket pattern with a bottom waistband. I've used this pattern so many times, so many times. It's just a really good like basic jacket pattern. With this one, because I didn't put the bottom waistband on, it's slightly cropped. So it has that slightly high-waisted Regency men's aesthetic. I also obviously put the braid on the front. Now originally I only had time to put a single line of braid for every detail. The extra braid I got about half of it on before the second event I played and I finished the rest of it in time for the third event. That's been a big feature of this costume that I've worked on it when I can and if stuff's not finished it doesn't matter. That's been really good for me. I've previously had some proper meltdowns over trying to get everything done in time or setting too high a bar. I seem to have finally hit the groove where I'm like, okay, half of my braid is done for this event and the other half isn't. You know what? No one's going to care. Literally no one's going to care. I also attacked this with a cheese grater. I also put mud on it. It did not stick. The biggest thing is obviously I made a hole in the exact spot. The satin lining puffs out of it. I used a lighter to singe it just to really sell the idea that it's a bullet hole. Because the trousers sit quite low on my hips and the jacket was sort of cropped, I had some awkward shirt middle going on, so I also made myself a sash. It was just a strip of the jacket fabric and a strip of the more purpley satin that I had sewn together. I did deliberately didn't finish the ends. I attacked it with a cheese grater. I got it muddy. Generally what I was going for with this was the idea that even as the son of a noble family and even as an officer, this country was in the middle of a civil war that they were not winning and there wasn't necessarily the time or the money to make beautiful dress uniforms for everyone. You got what you got. The final piece of clothing that I added to this costume was a coat. This is a aquascutum trench coat that I found at a market for 15 quid. It's way too big for me and it's also quite old. Having a big shabby overcoat, one, hid the jacket enough that I could reveal the jacket, but also it fit over the rest of as much costume as I wanted to wear, including the bandolier, which I'll talk about accessories in a second. The most important reason I had this though was just that it was waterproof. And sometimes you have to make decisions like, am I going to be able to go out fighting in the rain? Props wise, obviously weapons, I have two cap firing flintlock pistols. The system doesn't use caps, you just have to have something that looks appropriate and that you can point, which I love. For the first event, I just stuffed these in my belt because I didn't have anywhere else to put them. I also had this bandolier, which I bought off a leather crafts person. And honestly, I just love it. I didn't have a specific character in mind when I got it, but I find that actually it completes a lot of outfits and having the sort of cross body arrangement just balanced the silhouette nicely. I have a couple of really key accessories. I didn't want to give G a lot of noble trappings, but I picked out one ring that I thought looked good just to have something. I don't think I've ever really established what it is, but there's obviously a reason that he chose to hang on to this. This is a Victorian horror game, so I have my anatomical heart pin. I also needed something to be able to attach bits of paper to my jacket. That's how you do magical armor in this system, is you put symbols on yourself. And the way I do that is I pin bits of paper onto me. Because we were playing as a group concept, we decided we were going to have an item that identifies 
identified us as a group and what we settled on was I actually broke a plate so we each have four shards from this broken plate and when you put them together they form they match up I also have two rings on here this is canonically G's parents wedding rings he's hanging on to those for reasons not ruling out they get used in anger in one of these games to come so the pistols covered my weapon skills the bandolier covered my requirement of having lots of bits of paper on me at any given time because I love the system but there are so many bits of paper I also needed to use my magic skills I needed a focus for evocation which is the combat magic and I needed a ritual kit for ritual magic which is the slower long form big effects magic I had a deck of cards that had been in a bag that had got wet so it was kind of ruined for semi obvious reasons I picked the ace of spades and the queen of hearts as the two cards to be on the outside I wrapped it up with the string and I sealed it with wax I wanted it to look battered and improvised and given everything that happened water damage was very appropriate it was also just great to be able to use something that was otherwise unusable but originally very nice for my ritual kit I decided to use tarot deck I also have spread cloth that came with one of my tarot decks it was the right aesthetic for what I wanted I decided that the kind of aesthetic magically that I wanted G to go for was very much early 20th century Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That felt appropriate for a vaguely 19th century character who'd spent most of his time at university. I also really like having a tarot deck and I picked a deck that I thought was very appropriate for this setting. I like having this because aside from anything else it gives me something to do to interact with people when I'm not in the middle of plot stuff. One of these days I will probably make a video about reading tarot at LARPs. I love it not only because it's a really good way of interacting with other characters, it's a really good way of drawing out other people's backstories and getting them to talk about themselves, but also at a LARP you don't pull any punches. I feel like when you read tarot in normal times you pull out the death card and you go well it's not bad. There's a lot of positive things about this and in a LARP you can just go oh no oh I'm really sorry. It's probably fine. It's basically a mechanism for very elaborate character assassinations in the game space. I really enjoy it. And then the final thing that I put together for the first event, which was something I'd never really done before. And I don't know that I would do for many characters, but it's worked out quite nicely. I wrote a diary. I always have a notebook on hand for characters anyway, because you always need to write stuff down, always. I also knew I wanted to have, as I said, the magic armor is put symbols on yourself so I have a bunch of historical magic nonsense that I've distressed and that I use that in the rituals I use it as magic armor but I also I wrote a fairly extended diary it's got extra ephemera in it as I've picked up new things as we've gone along I've added them into the books I've written about my experiences it's been stolen by other characters and read this was good this was good and so that was basically my costume for the first event I was at and I a really good time was had by all. I only cried like three times, I killed a whole bunch of monsters and one of the other player characters. It was great!
So then there was no LARP for three years. And for health reasons, when LARP did start up again, I wasn't in a great place to be able to do events. In the end, I ended up going to the last event but one back in autumn of last year, very last minute. I had very little time, basically got the go ahead to go about three weeks before the event. So I didn't really have time to do anything. What I did do is borrowed a shirt off one of my friends. She'd played the previous event with me. And it was her player character I killed. Wasn't deliberate, that was a thing. At one point, G ended up wearing one of her shirts. So that was a thing we just decided that he'd hung on to. And as his only other clothes, this is what he wore for this event. One thing I did do, I had time for one project. And so the one thing I did do is I decided that the pistol situation wasn't really working for me. And I had a go at making some holsters. I'm still very new to leathercraft. They didn't turn out the best. And in the end, I didn't use them a lot that event anyway. So they've mostly been used in the most recent event. And now I have some feedback. They're slightly too big. The guns sit too low, but they were a really simple cut out some leather, rivet it together. The most complex thing I did was cutting the lace design into some contrasting leather. I quite like how this turns out. I was a bit messy with the, it's just glued in place. Why would I do anything more substantial than that? They're fine. I think I'm going to add some, probably take some foam, wrap it in either more leather or maybe velvet and stick it inside the top and inside the very bottom just to make sure that the pistols don't slide all the way down inside and to give it some stability because this is quite a soft leather. I wouldn't really have picked quite a soft leather if I hadn't just been using stuff I already had. Brings me to the most recent event. This event, I knew I was going. I booked as soon as bookings opened. There was still a chance that I would have to drop out for health reasons, but it wasn't a good chance. With about two months to go, I went, you know what? This guy has spent two entire events complaining that he only has one shirt. I don't have any big projects on at the moment. I haven't costumed a LARP character in a long time. Let's make some kit. So I made an ordered list of what I wanted in order of how important it was. And this included breaking it down into some things could hit play, not finished and be okay. So in order, the first thing I wanted was a shirt. I want to be clear that I did not originally set out to entirely hand sew this shirt. That just happened somehow. So because this game does not have one defining historical period that it's based on, I decided I was going to do something that I love, smushing historical periods together and making them be friends. So with this shirt, I originally was going to make a 18th century shirt. I've sort of kept the sleeves, but then I decided that actually I really liked Nicole Rudolph's early Victorian shirt that she made for her Gonzo cosplay. So I ended up combining elements of the two. It's been washed and I've ironed it, but it's not ironed as well this time around. So I'm going to have to steam it. So I gave this shirt a placket in front with buttons and tucks, giving it a very generic hybrid between time periods collar. Now that I've worn it, this collar is not tall enough. It sneaks down under the cravat and it just doesn't quite reach. We can fix that for next time. Early Victorian shirt had very conservative sleeves. I'm not about that life. I want big, fluffy, voluminous 18th century sleeves. But what I also did, I'm gonna have to figure out how to iron these back in, is I smocked the top of the sleeve heads. It sits very nicely on my bicep and looks very decorative and very bougie. I love smocking. I feel like there's probably a video in that because every time I do it, people are like, oh, I really wanna learn how to do that. It's so easy. Honestly, the worst thing about it is the time you spend marking up the grid. So this is entirely hand sewn. Seams are flat felt throughout. Because of where I'm at with my LARP kit journey right now, I wasn't gonna invest a lot of time and energy into something unless I was going to literally wear it in my everyday wardrobe. So I took the time to make it something that could be washed in a regular washing machine. Not got time to hand wash anything. I expect to get a lot of wear out of this. You will probably see it in future times. The only thing is it is very see-through and a little snugger on the chest than I wanted. I should have made it somewhat bigger. I'd need to wear something over it because I can't wear something under it. The next thing on my wish list was a waistcoat. Now, actually, I wanted two waistcoats. I was referencing Nicole Rudolph's Gonzo series because I love the Muppet Christmas Carol and I love that costume and I love how bonkers early Victorian men's fashion is before they get all boring. And I loved the idea of, because I knew I wasn't going to be making a new jacket, there is no way G was parting with his military jacket. I liked the idea of having two waistcoats, but I would have accepted going to the event with one. So I started with one waistcoat. There are not a lot of good resources 
trousers on menswear, historical menswear. This is a problem. We're not going to get too into sexism in historical costuming. There's not a lot of resources for historical menswear. I was a bit limited in what I had access to. My options were the cut of men's clothing, which didn't really have a waistcoat for the eras that I wanted, actual historical tailoring manuals, which are when you see these very elaborate things like the Keystone Cutting Guide, that is late Victorian. The early tailoring manuals are like, it's about this shape. We're not even going to tell you how to measure it. This is the shape you're aiming for. Just, you know what you're doing, right? I don't. I absolutely do not. I settled on the least challenging to draft option, given that I was on a time limit, which ended up being the 1790s waistcoat from Costume Close Up. This is based on the Colonial Williamsburg collection. I have a complex relationship with this book. On the one hand, I really appreciate that it has some more normal person clothes in it than, say, Patterns of Fashion does. I also really appreciate that it has almost as much, if not as much, menswear as women's wear. Don't get me started on the people who complain that this is mostly a menswear book. It's pretty much 50-50. Gosh, doesn't that remind you of some other things? However, Costume Close-Up was... It itself states that it was not written with the idea that you would use these patterns to try and recreate the garments, so the patterns are not really really set up for you to scale them up out of the book. I don't know what they thought people were going to do with this book. It's just very confusing, but the summary version is there are patterns, they do have a scale, they're not gridded, there's not really any help for scaling them up and indeed resizing them, which obviously I am not a standard men's size, I need to rescale things pretty heavily. But it was four pattern pieces. I'm okay at pattern drafting and I went, you know what, let's just try it. Turns out, whatever I did, and like I said, I will at some point make a video so I can show you what I did. Whatever I did just worked. They fit great and they look amazing. So the first waistcoat I made was out of, this is a kimono wool. The back is a scrap of silk satin that I just had lying around. I just lined it in random bits of poly cotton that I had. There's no structure in this, it's a single layer. I made my life way too difficult. I used the random scraps to make a mock-up. I tried the mock-up on. I went, yes, this is amazing and exactly what I want. And then I said, well, why don't I just use this and sort of add the outer on over the top. This involved more hand sewing than was actually necessary. I absolutely love about this waistcoat that it has these shoulder extensions. It means it fits over the top of your shoulder really beautifully. I also decided if I only got one waistcoat done, it would be this waistcoat it was basically done. So I put put buttons and buttonholes on this one. I decided, because I never have buttons on hand, to actually use fabric buttons. So it's just a circle of fabric that is gathered up into a hard little ball. It works great. It looks great. It fits me really well. I love it. It's amazing. And at that point, three things left on my list. A cravat, a second waistcoat, and an overcoat. This is not the order I did them in for the purposes of this video. We're going to talk about the second waistcoat now, because we've had first waistcoat. But what about second waistcoat? For second waistcoat I had this and it was a scrap. It's like a brown dupioni with a pink satin stripe through it and I really wanted to make this into a waistcoat ever since I bought like a bundle of silk scraps and one of them was this and I was like that's a waistcoat. It was not big enough to make a waistcoat. Where does that ever stop me? So this waistcoat is actually about an inch shorter than the other one. It's a second waistcoat, that doesn't matter. The lining of the fronts and the back is a brown silk satin that I just have. It was going to be a Victorian or part of a Victorian Brussels dress that I never got around to making. I don't think I'm playing that game again, unfortunately. I have no reason to make all of the Victorian Brussels dresses that I had planned, other than I like Victorian Brussels dresses. We shall see. With this waistcoat, especially since it was going to be hanging open, even though I want to be able to wear it on its own one day, I decided to give it some more structure. I also needed to heavily piece the outer. One of the fronts has one seam in it, and the other one has about a million, and one of those seams is actually coming apart, which is very disappointing, but I'll fix that. I was very impressed with my pattern matching. The outer is mounted onto a layer of linen, which is bright green, but no one knows. No one can tell. You can't see it. And then there's additionally a piece of blackout curtain lining, I think it is. It's just some heavy fabric that I had, which is pad stitched into the fronts. That's what's giving the collar its roll line, is just pad stitching. Pad stitching is one of those things that's extremely easy to 
learn and I think extremely difficult to master. I don't seem to be able to do which way around is concurve and convex. If I'm doing the roll line, I'm bending the fabric over one of my fingers and working onto the fold so the fabric's curving away from me. Brilliant. If I'm working on like the inside of the front and the fabric's curving towards me, that doesn't seem to work. And I have since realized that I could have just flipped it over and worked from the other side and then it would have. Either way, the pad stitching was mainly just to hold layers together and reinforce it. In this case, the roll lines turned out great. This doesn't have buttons and buttonholes yet. There is so little of this striped fabric left that the buttons, I think I'll do fabric buttons again, but they're going to be of the brown satin. I think that's going to be fine, if not great. This looked amazing, just worn open on top, peeking out from under my jacket. I thought it was great. Honestly thrilled to have a waistcoat pattern that really fits me. I'm a simple queer with simple needs. The cravat, I knew there was a non-zero, if not significant chance that this was going to end up covered in flaked blood and wrapped around someone's arm or whatever. Oh, it smells of his perfume. Nice. I cut a square out of the only piece of cotton that was big enough to make a cravat out of, which turned out to be some cotton organdy, so it pressed great. Hand sewed a hem in because uh, I've lost control of my life. It was something I could do on a train. It wasn't too much of a problem. Followed an online tutorial for folding it and tying it. Very happy with that, except for... So cravats vary in size somewhat. The size range I was given was 30 to 33 inches along the side. I went with 30 because I was short on fabric. I think I need a bigger one. I think I need a 33. I'm going to potentially look into maybe getting G a silk one for next event because that didn't end up covered in fake blood. Everyone was very respectful. The boy maybe needs a silk cravat for next event. It's the final event. I'm going to go all out. And then the final thing I wanted to make was an overcoat. So we weren't sure what the weather for this event was going to be like. It ended up being gorgeous. At like a month out, it looked like it was going to pour with rain all weekend. Welcome to Britain in spring. I had this. It's a very thin, very dense wool. I've had wools like this that have been described as either a Melton or a boiled wool. This is thinner than anything I've had before, but it has the same texture and it has the same ability to not really fray. I looked through the books that I have and anything that was online to look at drafting a late 18th century Regency early Victorian overcoat. They were all nightmares. The cut of men's clothing had some Something that I thought was about right, but I just looked at drafting from the cut of men's clothing is really annoying. Even more annoying than costume close-up, which is impressive. You gotta remember that the cut of men's clothing is quite old. So in the end, I pulled out a commercial pattern that I'd used before. It's the McCall's Civil War uniform pattern. So we're already going like historically adjacent. When I used it previously, I had made it smaller in the chest and shoulder because I'm smaller in the chest and shoulder. Shoulders are still a bit big on this. I think I want to bring them in a little bit more. Especially for something I was throwing on over the top, that's great. A little bit oversized is great. To make that pattern more closely resemble the historical patterns I've seen, I combined the front and side back pieces. So this coat has a centre back seam, a side back seam, and that's it. The side back piece wraps all the way around to the front. Two part sleeves I left as they were because two part sleeves are great. Instead of using the skirt panels that came with the pattern, I drafted a half circle. I wanted more swoosh and less sewing. The fabric wasn't wide enough, so instead of using one quarter circle pattern, cut it in half so I could cut four eighths. This also allowed me to put pockets on the side seams because one thing I've noticed about systems where they give you a lot of bits of paper and stuff, pockets. So I've got big deep pockets in my side seams. This coat doesn't have hems. Wool is such that I just left the edge raw. To make it look less unfinished, I have used some very heavy top stitching throughout the coat. I did it in pink because why not? I already had the pink waistcoat and the lining material I wanted to use, which is a actually a silk. I bought it off V Birchwood. I bought it off Vassy because it was damaged, couldn't be used for anything else. And I think lining a coat for a rakishly disheveled character would work perfectly for that. I did not get as far as putting the lining in. That's something that I want to do, but because of the way the coat is constructed, I knew I could make the outer shell. And as long as the main construction was down, I would be going back in and adding the lining in by hand anyway. So it was completely fine for the coat to hit play in this situation. And I'll add the lining for the final event or after even, it doesn't matter. The 
again, this is something that I think I'm going to get a lot of wear out of in general. It's a pretty good coat. And then finally, there was a couple of extra accessories. So I was putting my notebook down all the time and losing it. So I made a notebook holster. I just had a couple of little buckles lying around. I used some scrap leather and some rivets. It doesn't work great. Pretty much the best thing I've come up with so far. So we're probably just going to deal with that. It didn't take very long and it didn't take a lot of materials. And so the fact that it's not really going to be usable for anything else is kind of neither here nor there. And also, so G ends up having to do some babysitting. I think that's probably the most non-spoilery way I can describe that. And so I decided to bring this is some colored pencils. This is, this is a baby's coloring book because what is LARP for if not trolling your best friends? Overall, I'm incredibly happy with this costume. I'm really pleased about the fact that certainly some of the newer pieces of kit I'm going to just wear, which is a really big shift from where I was in 2019, where not only was I not really thinking about the reusability of kit, in my head it was still always costume. So even trying to make a costume that I wasn't going to have to make new things or find new things or make big adjustments to over the lifetime of playing the character, I was still choosing something that was never going to be useful again and also that just wasn't clothes. Now I'm making clothes. The fact that they're very eccentric clothes doesn't stop them from being great clothes. I'm also really happy where I'm at with the final event of the system is going to be later this year and there's a couple of tweaks I want to make. Maybe a new cravat, add the coat lining, buttons on the waistcoat, make some alterations to the holsters. That's kind of it. I did go back and forth on maybe making full front breeches but we'll see. We'll see how I go. Fundamentally, I have trousers that work fine, so it's not essential. Likewise, the boots that I use are on their last legs, but I'm going to wear them for one more event and then probably get rid of them because they are dead. In general, I found the kit really comfortable, really easy to move in. This is a very active game. I also just really liked how I looked in it. I felt 
like a sexy Regency hero. And that's all I really want in life is, you know, someone in an empire waisted dress to swoon in my arms and I don't know, what else did Sharp do? Do some war crimes? Laugh's a weird hobby. It may seem weird given that I have an entire channel devoted to costuming and making costume and I really love making costume. I will always tell new LARPers and some experienced LARPers who need to be reminded that your kit is not actually very important. What matters is that you're there, what matters is that you're role playing, what matters is that you are making game for other people and interacting and having a good time. But fundamentally these clothes make me feel good about myself and about my character and that does reflect on my general mental state when I approach the game. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about your kit but if you feel good in it that's really really positive. I do intend to make videos a bit later about the shirt. I will be making another one. Be patient though it's hand sewn it's gonna take me a while. I might try and get a smocking video out at some point a bit sooner because that's not so difficult. I will also because I'm going to be making more of them do a video on the waistcoats and take you through the drafting process and I will also so I will not be making another coat but because I'm going to be putting the lining in and I can also take you through how I altered the pattern and that. More videos on these subjects will be forthcoming. Unsurprisingly I have a whole bunch of sewing videos planned for the next many many months but also I sewing takes time and I do want to talk about LARP a bit more so gonna try and as always find the balance between those of you who are only here for the sewing and those of you who are only here for me being incredibly salty about a hobby I allegedly enjoy. I've seen my viewer numbers! I know what you're doing. But now this is getting out of hand, so thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. You can follow me on Instagram for pictures of my cat. You can follow me on TikTok for slightly unhinged short form videos. You can also find me on Facebook if you want to get all the same information as my Instagram and TikTok and community page, but on Facebook. I don't know, I don't judge. Down in the description box you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or reoccurring financial donation to support this channel and all of my bad decisions. Kofi supporters get early access to all of my videos, permanent access to things like live streams which get delisted after a while, and the odd extra sneak peek into what's coming soon. I'm also considering doing like polls so that when I have a bunch of ideas for stuff that can happen next, like I do now, you can let me know which one you're most excited about and you want to see first. I don't know, we're gonna try it, we're gonna see if it works. And that's all there is from me this time, so dream big. I'll see you next time.